So welcome back. Today we're going to cover model selection and regularization. But we have a special guest, my former graduate student, Daniela Witten. Hi. Welcome, Daniela. Thank you. Uh, Daniela is now at University of Washington, but maybe you want to tell, you, tell students a bit about yourself and how you got to be here. Yeah, well, I, um, in college I studied math and biology. And when I was graduating, I knew I wanted to, to go to grad school in something, but I couldn't really decide on one particular thing that I wanted to study for the rest of my life. And so I ended up doing a PhD in statistics, and I was lucky enough to do it at Stanford with Rob. Mm -hmm. And um, I graduated in 2010, moved up to Seattle, and I'm now an assistant professor at the University of Washington in the biostat department there. And uh, I didn't I invite Danielle here just because she's a, she's a great student and friend, but also she's a co-author of the textbook on this, this course is based. So uh, Danielle and I are gonna uh, give today's talk together. So we're gonna talk about Model selection and regularization. So let's recall the, the linear model we've talked about already in the course. We have response of variable y, and we're going to model it as a function of some, some predictors or features, x1 through xp. And we've talked about least squares for doing that uh, earlier in the course. And in, in, um, later on in the course, we'll talk about ways of making that model more general, making it nonlinear, for example, or uh, we'll, we'll have um, Additive but not but nonlinear models in chapter in the, the the lectures that cover chapter seven. We'll consider nonlinear models in chapter eight, things like trees and boosting. But today, actually, we're going to stick to the, the linear model and talk about a different way of fitting the linear model. Why? Well, because the the model, although it's very simple and it's actually been around since probably the 1920s and 1930s, uh, is a it's a very important model because it's it's simple, which means it, it can be interpreted. There's a small number of coefficients typically if we have a small number of features that are important. It, all, it also it predicts future data quite well in, in a lot of cases, despite the fact it's simple. So we want to talk today about ways of, 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 of fading the linear model that improving on least squares by selecting or shrinking the, feet, the, the, the coefficients of features to make the model more interpretable and in some cases to, to predict better. So we'll talk about a number of methods of doing that today. Um, and I'll we'll just say a little more about these, the two objectives. When the, when the number of features is bigger than the number of samples, and we've talked about that in the course already, this is a situation that comes up more and more often these days where we have a lot of features you measure on patients or in business, maybe on a stock, or um, um, in other situations, you can, it's cheap to measure things now. And, it, and it's often the case when that P might be much bigger than the, N, the number of samples. So in that situation, of course, we can't use full least squares because the these solution is not even defined. So somehow we have to reduce the number of features. And that becomes more and more important, uh, not just to obtain a solution, but to avoid f fitting the data too hard. So when we um, want to predict better, well, we, we'll shrink or regularize or select features in order to improve the prediction. And along the same lines, when we have a small number of features, the model becomes more interpretable. Right? If we, if we ha hand our collaborator a few hundred features and say these are important, that, that might be hard to interpret. If we compare them down to the most important five or ten, it becomes a, 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 um, a, a, it's easier to interpret and, and, from a scientific point of view, um, more useful. So, what we call uh, feature selection is, is a way of, of choosing among features to find the ones that are most informative. So, we'll talk about three classes of, of techniques in today's lecture: subset selection, where we try to find among the p predictors the ones that are, that are the, the most related to the response. And we'll see different flavors of subset selection. Um, best subset selection, we'll, 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 look, we'll try to look among all possible combinations of features to find the, find the ones that are the most predictive. And then there'll be, we'll talk about forward and, 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 and backward stepwise methods, which don't try to find the best among all possible combinations, but try to do an intelligent search through the space of models. So forward stepwise, backward stepwise, and all subsets. And then some more modern techniques known as shrinkage methods in which we don't actually select variables explicitly, but rather we, we put on a penalty uh, to penalize the model for the, um, the number of coefficients, or the size of coefficients in various ways. So we'll talk about ridge regression and the lasso in the shrinkage section. Now finally, in the, in the third section, dimension reduction, we'll talk about ways of finding um, combinations of variables, uh, extracting Im important combinations of variables, and, and then using those combinations as, as, as the um, the features in regression. We'll talk about PCR, principal components regression, and partial least squares in that, those settings. So three different classes of methods, three classes of methods we'll talk about today. 
And one of the things um, about today's lecture is that we're going to be looking at all of these ideas within the context of linear regression. So if you're trying to predict some quantitative response and you um, want to fit a less flexible but perhaps more predictive and also more interpretable model, these are ways that you can shrink, in a sense, your, your usual least squared solution in order to get better results. Um, but these can just as well, these concepts can just as well be applied in the context of logistic regression or really your favorite model depending on the data set that you have at hand and the type of response that you're trying to predict. And so, so even though linear regression is really what we'll be talking about here, these, these really apply to logistic and other types of models. Okay, so Danielle is going to first of all tell us about subset selection. So best subset selection is a really simple idea. And the idea here is suppose that we have access to P predictors, but we want to actually have um, a simpler model that involves only a subset of those P predictors. Well, the natural way to do it is to consider every possible subset of P predictors and to, to choose the best model out of, all, out of every single model that just contains some of the predictors. And so the way that we do this is in a very organized way. We first create a model that we're going to call M0. And M0 is the, no mo is the null model that contains no predictors. It just contains an intercept. And we're just going to predict the sample mean for each observation. So that's going to give us M0. And now we're going we're to try to create a model called M1. And M1 is going to be the best model that contains exactly one predictor. So in order to get M1, we need to look at all P models that contain exactly one predictor. And we have to find the best among those P models. Next, we want to find a model called M2. That's going to be the best model that contains two predictors. So how many models are there that contain two predictors if we have, if we have P predictors in total? And the answer is P choose two. Um, so if you haven't seen this notation before, um, this, is, this notation is written like this. It's pronounced choose. So this means P choose two. And it's equal to P factorial divided by two factorial times p minus 2 factorial. And that is actually the number of possible models that I can get that contain exactly two predictors out of p predictors total. And um, so I can consider all p choose two models containing two predictors. I'm going to choose the best one, and I'm going to call it m2, and so on. I can keep on um, getting the best model with three predictors, four predictors, and so on, up to the best model with p predictors. So if I'm choosing the best model out of all models containing three predictors in order to get, let's say, M3, I can do that in a pretty straightforward way because I can just say that out of all models containing three predictors, the best one is the one with the smallest residual sum of squares, or equivalently, the largest R squared. And so in this way, I get a best model containing 0, 1, 2, all the way through P predictors. I've called them M0, M1, M2, all the way through MP. And now I'm on to step three, and in this final step, all that I need to do is choose the best model out of M0 through MP. And in order to do this, actually, um, this, this step three is a little bit subtle because we need to be very careful that we choose a model that really has the smallest test error rather than the model that has the smallest training error. And so there are a number of techniques that we can use to choose a single best model from among M0 to MP, um, and these include prediction error, estimated through cross-validation, um, as well as some methods that we're going to talk about later in this lecture, which you might not have seen before. And these include um, Mallow's CP, Bayesian Information Criterion, and Adjusted R squared. So we'll come back to, to the, some of those topics in a few minutes. So here's an example on the credit data set. And we saw this, um, this data set in one of the earlier chapters. And this is a data set that contains 10 predictors. Um, involving things like um, number of credit cards and credit rating and credit limit. And the goal is to predict a quantitative response, which is credit card balance. And so what we can do is um, we can look at every single model that contains a subset of these 10 predictors. And these models are actually plotted here on the left-hand side. Um, so here, this x-axis is the number of predictors. It actually goes from 1 to 11 because one of these predictors is categorical with three levels. And so um, we used uh, a couple of demi variables to encode that. And on the y-axis is the residual sum of squares for each of the possible models. So for instance, like this dot right here, 
indicates a model that contains one predictor with a pretty terrible residual sum of squares. And all the way down here, we've got a model with 11 predictors that has a pretty decent residual sum of squares. So the reason that there's a lot of dots in this picture is because there's a lot of possible submodels given um, 10 total predictors. And in fact, as we're going to see in a couple minutes, there's 2 to the 10 submodels. So there's actually 2 to the 10 dots in this picture, although some of them are sort of on top of each other. And so this red line here indicates the best model of each size. So this red, this red dot right here is M0. That's, excuse me, it's, it, this is M1. What I, just, what I just showed you is M1. So that's the best model containing one predictor, because that is the smallest residual sum of squares. This is the best model containing two predictors. This is M3, best model containing three predictors, and so on. So when we perform best subset selection, what we really do is we trace out this curve to, when we get M0 through MP. And now we're just going to need to find a way to choose, you know, is M10 better than or worse than M4, and so on. We're just going to have to choose among that lower frontier. So, so on the left-hand side here, we see number of predictors against residual sum of squares. And on the right-hand side, we've got number of predictors against R squared. And as we saw in chapter 3, R squared just tells you the proportion of variance explained by a uh, linear regression model, by a least squares model. And so once again, we see a whole lot of gray dots indicating every possible model containing a subset of, of these 10 predictors. And then the, the, the red line shows the best model of each size. So again, this is the M1 that we saw earlier. This is M2. Over here is M10. And um, what we notice is that, that as the models get bigger, as we look at larger and larger models, the residual sum of squares decreases and the R squared increases. So um, do we have any idea of why that's happening? Maybe Rob can tell us. I can tell you, yeah. So it's because as you add in variable, things cannot get worse, right? If you have a subset of size 3, for example, and you look for the best subset of size 4, then at the very worst, you could set the coefficient for the fourth variable to be 0, and you do the same as you'll have the same uh, error as for the three variable model. So the curve can never, it can never get worse. It can be flat. If we clear the slide here, we can see it looks like it's actually flat from about three predictors on to t from three about up, up to 11. But it's certainly, uh, it's not going to go up, but it can, it can, it cannot, it's, it can go, be flat as it is in this case, but we can't do any worse by adding a predictor. And actually what Rob yeah. just said relates to the idea that, um, you know, remember on the, on the previous slide here in step three when we were talking about best subset selection, we had this step and I said that in order to choose among the best model of each size, we're going to need to be really careful. We're going to have to use cross-validation or CP, BIC, adjusted R squared. And that really relates to what's going on here. Because, you know, if, if I asked you, hey, what's the best model with eight predictors? You'd say, okay, here are all of the model with, models with eight predictors. And, like, clearly this is the best one. It's got the smallest residual sum of squares. There's no argument. But if I ask you, which is better, this model here or this model there, Suddenly, it's not so straightforward because you're kind of comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing a model with four predictors to a model with eight predictors. You can't just look at which one has a smaller residual sum of squares because you would, because of course, the one with eight predictors is going to have a smaller residual sum of squares. So, in order to really, in a meaningful way, choose among a set of models with different predictors, we're going to have to be careful, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Good.